Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Eastern Current. I'm Billy Thorpe, and this is Judson Brock. Judson Brock. I'm going to bring... Dude, look at that, man. Everything's working perfect nice. tonight. I guess we just had to do a little different... Yeah, knock on... Where's the Where's the nearest piece of wood at, man? So, dude, <laughs> episode nine of Eastern Current. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining us as we're just letting people jump on here um, and you know like this video, share this video, help us... Do all those things. So welcome. We're going to be with uh, Richard Andrews. We're going to be talking about catching those giant red drum and red or red fish, I should say. The old drum. The old drum. The old grandpa drum. Grandma and grandpa drum up there in the Pamlico area. So welcome to the show. Welcome to the broadcast. I see several people jumping on. Give us a thumbs up if you're watching, if you can hear us, if you can see us. Uh, we working around all of our tech stuff from last week. Just tricked our technology so doing pretty good, Judson. What have you been up to, man? How's fishing out there this week? Man, it's been it's been pretty good the past week since our last show. Today was a really tough day for me. Um, I kind of struggled pretty hard today to get on the redfish. We had like a low tide pretty early and was banking on. We were fly fishing and banking on some you know some belly crawling redfish on the beginning of the first tide. Some real shallow redfish. We had some of that, but it was slow. We've just got really big tides right now and. Um, sometimes it feels like they they're fired up on those big tides, and other times it feels like I can't find them. And today they must like all have one a of those sinus days. infection like me, so they're not feeling good. Yeah, they're, they're just hanging out, out deep, I guess. <laughs> but it was a beautiful day on the water. Um, awesome day to be out there. We um, we had a pretty fun little triple boat trip, hanging out with some other guide buddies that that I'm friends with, and uh, it was a fun day. It was a fun day. Yeah, man. Well, that sounds good. Well, I know I was. I know you and I were supposed to go out tomorrow and do a little fishing, but you got booked up. So hopefully we can reschedule that. I had pretty, to bail on Billy. Soon. I know, man. The one day I was like, dude, nothing can stop me from getting on this boat with Judson, uh, except for Judson's clients. Which except for a couple this, hundred bucks. If, yeah, a few hundred. Yeah, a couple hundred bucks. So if you're watching this, hope you have a good, good time tomorrow and catch a lot of stuff. So, hey, guys, and speaking <laughs> of, if you guys are watching, let us know where you're watching from. Uh, love, to, love to know where you're tuning in. I actually got on some of our uh, video like analytics or statistics, man. And, and a lot of people from a lot of different States, man, from Florida to Georgia, New York city, like, or New York, rather a lot of places watching. So we That's appreciate awesome you guys uh, shooting that out to us. I want to say Forrest gray, man. Thanks. I see you jumping on live again. He actually subscribed to our podcast. I think our very first podcast subscriber. And so now he's watching the live show. So that's nice. pretty cool as well. Um, yeah, man. So awesome, dude. Well, I will get into what else we have going on, dude. What do you, what do we got going on? So oh, well, I just want to reiterate one time that like Billy was saying, like share this on your Facebook and Instagram right now right that we're now. live. That helps us more than anything. Get people on here. So, and like Billy was saying, go like, and subscribe to our podcast, go like, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. That helps us, um, like crazy. And, and, uh, we really appreciate it, but, but go yeah. share it right now on Facebook and Instagram. Like and, Billy and said. leave a comment and tell us where you're watching from and all that. And we're going to be giving away some awesome stuff we got a we, we got a nice little painting to give away again yeah, your mom did like hooked us up again with yeah some, like, she is awesome paintings, she's digging so. doing some fish paintings uh, speaking of, of people jumping on austin parker's with us tonight so appreciate austin he's always entertaining in the comments he is uh cameron what's up man thanks for joining us dave roger jones big fan of the show jason what's up man uh right like uh yeah forest again what's up dude it says you guys have to make a new shirt judson's face with the i like it i like it i like it I tell you what, I know a guy who makes T-shirts, so I'll <laughs> I'll tell him. So I'll make him one, and uh, we'll see. Yeah, we'll we'll get that going. So speaking of sponsors uh, of the show, we'll go ahead and get into this. I Strike. Uh, you can see the logos down below us there. So I Strike, big fans of the show ever since day one. They were on the show episode three with us. Uh, jump on their website. There's a, a bulk bulk rate on there. We can get on there and, and buy some jig heads and buy some of their their equipment uh, and get up to like forty percent off. Which yeah, is just ridiculous. Like yeah, just buying in bulk, which super, is what you need to do for jig heads, anyways. Yeah, just buy them in bulk. Support those guys. Um, Afco and Marshware. I believe you got a nice little Marshware shirt on over there. I don't I don't know if we can see it on camera or not, but. Uh, definitely like those guys and, and was rocking my Afco hat earlier. Love those guys. Appreciate them sponsoring. Uh, so go support those guys. Uh, Eastern Angling, Judson Brock here, taking you fishing. Uh, go go catch those red drum or whatever we're talking about. Have him take you up to the Pamlico. Are you going to do any guide trips up that way? Probably No, 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 no guide trips, but definitely going to be up there, uh, up there fishing myself. I can't wait to get up there. 
Yeah. Well, I might. Yeah. We'll see. Maybe we'll do a little eastern might, eastern might, angling little, excursion up there. Yeah, or eastern, eastern current excursion eastern up current, there. Eastern angling. Yeah, it'll be a little dual trip there. Uh, and then my business, Thorp Creative. Speaking of shirts, we can do shirts and hats and all that kind of promotional stuff for you. And one thing I never mentioned really is we don't have any minimums. So people go like, you know, like, can I get one shirt from you? The answer is yes, we can do that. Um, that's the number one question. And then CETO, we appreciate those guys. So if you find yourself in trouble, make sure you get a CETO membership or you might be paddling your way home. <laughs> Don't awesome. get caught without a paddle. Let's the catch of the week, Justin. You want to take us into that? Yeah, catch of the week this week is, you want to pull the slide up? Ooh. Pete Pascal with a nice redfish. He caught this. I think he was in Beaufort. I always get these mixed up. Beaufort, South Carolina this week, fishing with Captain Owen Player down there. And uh, caught this beautiful low tide tailing belly crawling redfish. Beautiful yeah, fish. He's beautiful. Pete's a great guy. He fishes up around uh, Wilmington Topsail a lot and um, catches a lot of nice redfish. He's he loves sight fishing and and he's pretty darn good at it. I've had the opportunity to actually fish with Pete one time and um, we had a blast. Really nice guy. So congratulations, Pete. And uh, we got some Afco Marshware goodies coming at you. Sweet. Yeah. So if you're watching Pete, just make sure you uh, shoot us a message on Facebook or Instagram. Um, I was going to say tweet at us, but I don't think we have a, a tweeter set up. We don't have a twit, a twit account. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to say hi to a few more people here. We got my mother-in-law. I have to say hi to my mother-in-law. She's watching from Tennessee. Big supporters of the show. Uh, we'll get into – they live on the South Holston River, which our guest, um, uh, Captain Richard Andrews, just got back from there. So we'll maybe talk about that a little yeah. bit. Uh, we got Don Myers from Charleston. We got Cameron watching. We got Cliff. I think Cliff is like probably coming up on Judy for for uh, like I, biggest fan of the show. He is. Since my mom joined her little card group, she has not been tuning into our shows. Oh. I'm a little butthurt about it. Oh, come on, Judy. <laughs> I want everyone to just say, "Come on, Judy. Where are you right now?" Oh, uh, we miss her. So yeah, he said he got the Pompano painting that Judy actually painted. Nice and, and loves that. So awesome, Josh watching from Randall in North Carolina, and then MJ Miller. Uh, he says, let me know when you come up to the noose. I'll steer you boys in the right direction. I believe we just got invited. I hey, like it. We'll up? be out there tomorrow morning. Well, dude, let's go ahead and get our guests on the show, man. Just had a lot of good pre-conversation with Richard um, before the show. So uh, I just got some notes on him here. He is the owner of Tarpam Guide Service. Been involved in North Carolina's charter fishing industry since 2001. So, uh, and, and Judson was just telling me, like, hey, one of the best guides like probably North Carolina. I mean, as for far sure. As, like, yeah. The fishery and everything like knows his stuff. He's born and raised on the tar river in Tarboro, North Carolina. So really just been fishing these waters for a really long time. Uh, and like I said, took a recent trip to the mountains, which I'm a fan of cause that's where I'm, I'm from. So maybe we can jump into that, but all right, man. So you want to bring him on? Let's yeah. Do it. Pull his picture on up. Let's bring video him on up. up here. Let's see what we got. What's, What's up, man? On, man? Hey y'all. How you doing? How's everybody? Oh, doing doing good. good. Well, uh, yeah, like Thanks like. For me. So what was that? Thanks for having me. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for coming on. I know we had some uh, some scheduling difficulties the first time. We're stoked we were able to make it happen. Absolutely. Um, yeah, like Billy was saying, Richard's just a solid dude. I've gotten to know Richard up on uh, up in Weldon just the past couple of years, fishing up there for stripers in this in the springtime, and um, just a super cool dude and. Um, I'm always hopping on Instagram and I see his, his pictures and I'm just always so, so jealous, especially like the beginning of striper season when I'm like wanting to be up there catching them and you're already freaking whacking them the whole way up the river. Um, but yeah, Richard, Richard's a cool dude. If y'all haven't had the opportunity to fish with him, he's definitely someone that y'all want to, y'all want to hit up. And like Billy was saying, Tarpam Guide Service is, uh, is his, is his company. Yeah. Tarpamguide.com. Go on there. Um, man, lots of good stuff on your website, by the way. I was, I was really impressed, you know, worked with a lot of guides over the last, uh, several years in different projects and things and you know one of the better websites i love the stories on there the blog so people can go on there and subscribe to that and check out you know more than just an advertising website i, I like it man i like the the personality of the of the site and and doing all that so yeah man uh, go tar and i'm saying that right right tarpamguide.com is that correct that's it tarpamlico is that where you're going <laughs> that's it that's my home water i like it i like it there it is it's already coming out i I say I like it all the time on the show for some reason. I never say it in real life, but for some reason on here, I always say I like it. But, um, well, cool. Well, we're just going to get started with some of these just opening questions. And, and the first one's how did you get into fishing? Like, what, 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 where was the, the love and the passion born? Well, you hear most people get into fishing. They started on a you know, farm pond or something like that. But I kind of got into it from the opposite end of the spectrum. Uh, 
I got in it through marlin fishing, and uh, I, I mean, you know, everybody's got that kind of that one moment where they were first hooked on fishing, and mine was I was fishing in the Hatteras Marlin Club tournament. I had a friend growing up who, whose dad had a sport fishing boat, and he, he's fishing all these uh, these marlin tournaments, and I I get invited along, and uh, I'd be I'd always be the one in the cockpit sitting out there watching the baits, you know, and everybody being there asleep, hungover, whatever. <laughs> and I'd, I'd be out there watching all the baits all day, and uh, I guess I liked it from the get go. But I, I, I was watching the spread one day, and we were pulling a the Spanish mackerel right down the middle on the short shotgun, and uh, saw this uh, peanut dolphin, this little baby baler, like just kind of loping through the spread. And he was getting chased, and I didn't know it at the time, but then, a, then about a 600-pounder comes up there and literally just inhales that Spanish mackerel. And once he realized he was hooked, he, he just he came completely out of the water. Like, I mean, went airborne, like tail out of the water, everything, went straight up out of the water like a rocket. And from that moment on, I was hooked on offshore fishing, and from the offshore days, it's kind of evolved into this. And so I, I kind of had a progression from big fish into small fish. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, I think that would get you hooked pretty quick. Were you the only one standing back there that saw the bite and everything? Well, I saw the do- I saw the little dolphin. I was like, "Hey, look at that!" And by, by the time you know, by the time everybody started looking back there, they, everybody saw that big blue and come up there and inhale that mackerel. And that's awesome. He, he, ended break, he ended up breaking us off, but it was pretty cool. It was it was it was a cool moment. I'll I'll, I'll, I'll remember that from forever. Well, that's super cool. That's yeah, super cool, dude. I know what, the only time I've ever seen uh, uh, a like a big fish like that come up in the spread it was like a school bus so when you see six five hundred six hundred seven hundred pound fish come up out of the water i mean it's like exciting but then you know my first thought when i was because i had a similar experience like everybody's like kind of chilling or whatever and then i see this thing just rip out of the water and i'm like uh i don't know what i'm hoping is gonna happen right now but it was pretty exciting here goes nothing but so. I, I mean, I grew up uh, shad fishing and striper fishing on the rivers, you know, the Tar River, the Roanoke River, and I fished, you know, ponds and that, you know, freshwater fish, that sort of thing. But as far as what I do now, I really didn't grow up doing it. I had to kind of teach myself, and it kind of was an evolution from my offshore far- charter fishing days into uh, now inshore guiding. And I, I really, really love what I do now, and love the kind of the style of fishing and the the small boat atmosphere, and being on there with just two or three clients is, is a lot of fun to me. Awesome. It's, uh, it's, it's, it, I, I, I stumbled across my words. I, I agree. I enjoyed that small boat fishing too. You really get to know the people you're on the boat with and have good conversation, but it works the other way too. When you get on the boat and someone doesn't like you or you're kind of annoyed <laughs> with them, it's, uh, it's a very small space to be for the day. Um, usually that doesn't happen, but, but it can. Yeah, man. That's one thing people ask me like, Oh, who should I go fishing with? You know? And, and I'll be like, well, what you should do is get out, go figure out who, what kind of fish you want to do. Call, five or six guides and just talk to them and then whoever you enjoy talking to the most because you're going to spend six hours on the boat with them right and you're going to pay them a chunk in cash so it's like at least if you're not catching fish or you've got a you know a, a rough day of weather wise like at least you enjoy the trip you know and same thing for the captain because i think that gives you guys kind of an out too like if some dude's on the phone like what's your ratio to cast to catch you know you can be like all right i'm not booking this guy <laughs> Yeah, there, I mean, there's definitely a certain amount of chemistry you have with your clients, certain clients and, and others you don't. But uh, you know, that's just that's just like just like life. You know, choosing your friends, you you naturally are attracted to other people sure. for friends. Yeah. And but yeah, it's a it's a fun job, and um, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I feel like I'm the luckiest guy in the world. And I'm sure you do, Justin. I'm sure you love what you do. I do. I really do love it. It's uh, I, I and it makes me sick days that I'm not on the water. It's pretty, and I'm like, golly, I, I could never be someone who has to sit in an office every day and and feel this way every single day. But, um, but yeah, that, that's awesome, man. That's really cool. I was actually having that conversation with my client today. It was a tough day, kind of pulling out all the BS about why it could be tough. And then I was just kind of explaining, you know, you can't control the fishing, but you can control the atmosphere on the boat. And so that's kind of what, as a guide, you're shooting for is like, all right, this is the one thing that I can 100% control for the most part is, is how we're interacting as, as clients and, 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 and guides. But well, cool. That's probably too much talk on my end. But the next question is, since we're talking old drum, let's let's talk. What was your, what's been your most epic day, your best day of old drum fishing? Whether that's you know artificials, maybe it was just one fish that you caught, or what's been your best, most epic day, most memorable day? Well, I don't do a lot of bait fishing for the drum anymore, mm-hmm. but I've definitely had some back when I did a lot of bait fishing. I've had some big days. You know, big double digit days at tw- you know twenty, twenty five, thirty, thirty five fish, that sort of thing. 
Um, the best day I've ever had corking was I think 35, and uh, I remember that. I remember that day very well. It was kind of early on in the whole corking evolution. I think you know Gary Dubiel had figured it out, and then the next year he kind of told a lot of people, and we started do, a lot of the guys started doing it. And there was we were all in the noose there. That's, that was when I got in the noose. I, I really fit, primarily fish the Panelco now, but uh, we were stretched out over about a four or five mile stretch. There were probably six or eight boats. Not all of them were guys, but most of them were. And we were right there in front of River Dunes, right there on uh, um, Gum Thicket Shoal. And uh, the bay was thick. The fish were there. It was just a massive school of fish there. I think everybody that day had probably between 25 and 60 fish per boat. Golly. Yeah, it was just, I mean, just hooking doubles and triples just constantly. Yeah. I mean, it was just sweating hard. I mean, just all you could do to get the fish. You know, I mean, it got to the point after a few pictures, you just reach down there and grab the hook and just pop it out of his mouth and yeah. and, 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 and say, all right, make another cast because you're, you're going to catch one of your next casts. So it was, it was that good. And I, I've had some days that are close to that, you know, where, 2025 fish on you know popping court fishing which is that's 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 enough i mean much more than that it's just it's just way too much work yeah and for my, sure i just i just turned 40 and my back's not getting any younger either so <laughs> once <laughs> you yeah, hit like it, 25 it, i think your back ages faster than you do that's right that's right well uh, yeah sorry what were you saying i totally interrupted you there i said it can get that good i mean it, when everything lines up right um I think my best day last year was 19, um, but really what I shoot for is just like a couple of fish per person on the boat. If I can do that, that that's kind of my minimum goal, and you know, six or eight fish, that's plenty. Yeah. You know? And we definitely have plenty of days where we catch one or two, or sometimes days we don't catch any. Yeah. So that, that does happen, but you know, I'd say maybe, I don't know, a quarter, a quarter of the time, 20% of the time during the season, we'll have an epic trip. Maybe maybe ten or twenty percent of the time we'll have a subpar trip, and you know the rest of them kind of fall right there in the middle somewhere. Yeah, I like it. Well, um, next, ne- all right. Here's my other question. With that, is what's been the biggest redfish you've had to the boat up there in the Pamlico? You think maybe you didn't weigh it, but what what do you think that that it went? Well, the biggest re- the re- biggest redfish I've ever seen was when I was offshore fishing for bluefin tuna, and oh. we caught we 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 trolled through a. Uh, a bait ball off of ochre coat. We were bluefin tuna fish in the winter, and we hooked two bluefins and two drum at the same time. <laughs> had four had four fish on. They were all on those big eighty wides. And uh, one of the drum we pulled in. I was fishing with a guy who's who he actually passed away in a duck hunting accident a couple years ago. A guy named Rich Barron from Hatters, and he caught a lot of drum in his life. And man, this drum was like um, different, different in a different category. I don't know how big it was. It was. It might have been. 58 or 60 inches long it was it was enormous we always wow. sat there we had, we had two blue fins hooked up pulling drag and we were sitting there going look at this drum we got on man this thing is <laughs> this thing's huge but to answer your question um we we consistently see them to about 52 53 inches in total length and if you have one that breaks the 50 inch mark or it's up there, fifty-one, fifty-two inches, and in, in, in at four at a fork length. That's a really, really, really exceptional fish. Yeah, today. that is. What would you? What do you think that goes weight wise? Well, there's a formula, and I can't remember the exact number right now. You do like girth times girth times fork length divide, and, and there's a divider. You do uh, you divide by like seven fifty-six or something like that, mm-hmm. and that gives you the weight plus or minus two two percent accuracy. Oh wow. Yeah, it's 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 an easy formula. You have to take pretty close measurements, but um, it, I mean, a fish like that, he's up there in the sixty pound range, somewhere yeah. in the upper fifties. I mean, the the fish that are about seem that are about forty five to fifty inches, they seem to be about a pound an inch. But once you get below the that for, kind of that mid forties range, they, they, that starts dropping off a lot. Like a forty two yeah. inch fish might be thirty five pounds. Does that, does that yeah, does that, that makes make, that makes perfect sense for sure. Yeah. So it seems girth, like girth, girth really matters. Definitely. It seems like those fish up there too in the Pamlico are, are super girthy. I mean, compared to some of the other, other bull red fish you see caught around the, uh, up and down the East coast and over in Louisiana and Texas, it seems like the North Carolina fish are just fat, just way fatter fish. Um, yeah. 
when you get an old when you get an old one, you can you know it's an old fish. It, it looks beat up. Its head's huge. I yeah. mean, it's just it's scratched. I mean, they, they those fish have got a lot of age on them. A lot, a lot of scars. A lot of a lot of battle scars. A lot of encounters with all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Is, so, there, is there a good way to like tell how old a fish is? I'm always curious if anybody knows the answer to that. Well, like, the state is the state has aged some of these drum, and I believe the oldest that they've ever aged is like 73 years old, somewhere in that range, in the in the low 70s. So, wow. imagine a fish swimming around for that many years. That's Dude, crazy. That's like hooking your grandma. That is insane. <laughs> that's insane. Yeah, that's right. I don't know if my grandma would fight quite as hard as those guys do. <laughs> that's she, sure, might. Yeah. she might. She might. Um, so, all right, so we're going to jump into kind of the, the fishing topics here. So the first thing I wanted to go over is kind of where to fish. So if you're, if you're going out to the Pamlico Sound, like, wh- what are you looking for? Like, if you're going to go fish a new area, maybe you're looking at Google Earth, whatnot, you're, and you're just kind of assessing what, what, uh, what you've got that day and conditions, what are you looking for as an area that might hold these big, these big drones? Well, first and foremost, you need a good contour map in your chart plotter. I, I have a one-foot contour map that I use. And, um, and that really helps show all the breaks and, and ledges. And basically what I do, you got to be prepared to do a lot of riding, especially early in the season. The first week or two of the season, like right now I'm in that early season mode where I'm riding, I'm looking, I am, I'm covering a lot of water. And, and what you're looking for is areas where bait is really heavily concentrated. Uh, it, most people who tarpon fish know this. They look for the most bait and usually that's where the tarpon are. Uh, same goes for the drum. But it's a tricky thing because year in and year out, these drum show up in different areas. The bait shows up in different areas. Like an area that, that you might be be fishing one year, that's dynamite one year. The next year, there's no bait there, and there's no drum there. So you, you got to be prepared to ride around, and, and most of the time, the, the bait is on the ledges, on the brakes. You know, that, that inside brake going from four to seven, or that, that, that we have like basically two brakes. You know, our, our, our river is a tabletop. It comes off the bank at about three to four feet and then drops to about, there's a drop off from about four to seven. And then you have another tabletop. It goes from about seven to 12 or 13. You know, that's kind of a, a rough estimate of that. Um, the Noose River has a lot of real pretty shoals and ledges. We have some, not quite as many on our end. Um, but those, those ledges of those shoals and just the, the river banks, or where all the bait is, where all the bait is, and but what you what you what's also important is the bait's behavior, and like so right now we're not seeing a lot of bait up on the surface because the water is fairly well oxygenated. A lot of times late in the summer like this, the water will go dead, and it will push all that bait up top and and and, and closer to the banks. The water in the middle of the river will go dead. It'll go anoxic. There's no oxygen in it, so the bait will rise up to the surface and it will move over up to the flats near the banks where it's where there's more oxygen where it can breathe so you'll find most of your bait along the ledges or up on the flats that late in the summer like this um we're hoping that the bait starts to behave differently the more bait you're seeing on the surface the easier it is to really find the bait and the easier it is to uh look for the indicators that you're looking for for the drum yeah when it's down like it is now you have to use your sonar and you just have to kind of get you have to get in an area and you have to kind of observe. You'll see a little bit of bait flipping here, a little bit there. You'll be marking. I mean, I mean, I marked a ton of bait today. I did not see. Um, and and in those cases, there's ba- there's basically two ways to fish. You get on a ledge and you ride the ledge hard. Like I'm one. I'll, I'll have one casting length going inshore where I might be casting into four feet. I'll have a casting length going offshore where I might be casting into you know, 12 or 13 feet. Does that make it? So yeah. I'm right on that break. If I'm not seeing active bait on the surface, that's what I'm doing. And But but I also want to be in a, on a ledge where I'm marking the bait. You know, I know the bait's there. It doesn't matter if it's up or down. It's just, it's got to be there. Right, right. And normally, if you stay right on that ledge in about eight to nine feet, really tight, that's how you, you know, keep your, control your drift so that you stay right on that break. And the, the breaks will change. They'll move offshore and they kind of move inshore and you kind of have to stay with it. You'll you'll get bit. You will get bit eventually, and it's just a matter of them running into you or you run into them. Uh, and when you get a bite, you'll get another bite. They're, they're not usually alone. Yeah. I mean, I, I hardly ever just catch one fish. It's usually one, two, or three right there together. 
Well, that's good information right there. You might answer most of my questions in my first section. All right. I like it. Show's, <laughs> show's over. Yeah. Do we have any questions coming in on, on Facebook? Yeah, let me uh, let me bring them up real quick because this would be a good time to to ask a couple questions here. So one one more thing to kind of jump into. So it's bait and and depth is super important. Are are you looking at? I know in Louisiana when I'm popping cork fishing, I love points with like current coming around points and stuff like that. Are you ever focusing in on on points or creek mouths or anything like that or or different types of bottom? They can come into play sometimes. Um, Last year I probably caught. More, most of my, I bet I caught 80 to 90% of my drum in less than six feet of water last year. Yeah. And, and when you're up there on the, on that upper flat closer to the bank, that's when you start noticing those features coming into play, like a little gut or, you know, it's draining out or a creek mouth or something like that. Or a, like, yeah, like you said, a point that has current. I have, I've caught them on points, you know, right up like a, like somewhere we catch speckled trout. Yeah. Uh, they will get in those areas. But as far as in, in schooled up and numbers, no, not really. Yeah. 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 Just picking off that one, maybe two. Some people may argue with that, but that's fine. They can argue with it. <laughs> yeah, I hear that. Um, do you? Have, how often are you running into you know floating fish and schooled up fish on the surface? Is that something you're seeing pretty commonly, um, or or not so much? Well, if if you're in an area that has a lot of fish, if you and if you get out there early enough, usually they'll they'll show themselves. Yeah, they'll, they'll bust. They'll they'll boil. They'll roll. Um, I mean, there's many mornings I go, not, well, not many, but some that I go out and I actually see fish, you know, chasing bait, like tunas, you know, going yeah. after in the ocean. I mean, they're, they're coming out of the water. They're streaking across the top, just in a super aggressive feed mode. Um, I see that some, sometimes you're just, you're just in an area, you're on a ledge. You might not be seeing a lot of sign on the surface and all of a sudden one just pops up right next to you and he, you know, you see a big boil. Usually when you see that, you can throw on them. You'll get a bite out of them. Okay. Nice. Cool. Well, man, I'm going to read some questions here um, kind of through the broadcast from our Facebook viewers. Uh, so we'll get into some of these really quickly. Um, well, I'll come back to that one because they're asking, like, how do you rig some stuff? So I think we got some questions. Yeah, we'll get into that line. with the... Uh, so here's a pretty good question. You may have answered this already. I'm not... I, I don't think you did. You're giving so much good information. I'm, like, trying to remember everything you said so I don't repeat <laughs> a question or anything. Uh, but, but so you're, you're out there, you're on the water, you're saying, Hey, you might have to do a little traveling to find these fish. So just for our viewers, like when is a good time of the year to start targeting these fish? So they're just not driving around aimlessly and, you know, middle of summer looking for them. Or like, is there a certain time that you see them start to push into that Pamlico area? There, there's some fish in the Pamlico year round. I've caught them as early as, uh, late May and as late as like early December. But that's not consistent numbers of fish. Uh, I would say con- consistent catches usually start somewhere in the late July, early August time frame with really consistent fish and really getting going more around the m- middle August. Like, so we're, we're like a week out right now. Like, we're catching fish right now, but it's not as consistent as I would like it to be, and the numbers aren't quite as high as I'd like to see them. But that, that will change very quickly. There's still a lot of fish out in the ocean um the guys at oregon inlet are still catching them good out there there's some big schools they're encountering there'll be there'll be more and more fish coming in usually by mid to late august like the third fourth week of august it's 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 as good as you want it to be okay and what causes those big old drum to push into the bay or to into the area to the sound there? well they're though they're they're here to spawn um oh, gotcha. they, okay. yeah they spawn usually around um deep um shell bottom areas in the sound and um so that's what, the, and they spawn heavily around the full moons of, of August and September. Okay. And the time, the timing of the moon, uh, when that, you know, whenever you, when you have the moon, if it's like late in September, then the fish will be, be here later uh, than normal. Or, or if you have a, a full moon that's that's in early September, and then you have another one in early August. I mean, sorry, early October. That's the fish will hang around a lot of times for that October moon, and and and, and there'll be some spawn around it. So. Everybody always asks me, like, they want to put their trip around the moon, but really unless you're not you're fishing bait in the late late evenings and, and nighttime fishing, the moon the moon fishing's tough for what we do, like cork, cork fishing and artificial fishing in the mornings. I don't really like fishing around the moons. It can make those fish not bite very well during the day. Okay, gotcha. Well, I mean, and speaking of, and I guess we can kind of get into this part of the, of the show, we've got a lot of questions about 
how do you rig stuff like artificials how do you rig popping courts what artificials underneath them um so man maybe we'll jump yeah right i'll jump into, into it and we'll yeah, see let's go ahead and do that so is there a specific cork that you like to use? I know those blabbermouths are getting pretty popular, a little bit louder cork, but is, are you using a couple different kinds, or you, you got one you really like? No, I'll, I'll show you. I've got some props here beside me. Nice. I'll reach down for you. We love perfect. a good prop. Oh, perfect. <laughs> this is when the tips start rolling in. <laughs> yeah, so let's see. Let me let me put that in front of the camera. Okay, so that's the cork that I used to use a lot before the blabbermouth kind of came on the scene. Yep. That's the Bomber Paradise Popper. It's a good cork. I, it seemed to outcatch, you know, some of the other brands that I used. Uh, I mean, I, I had, I remember one day in particular where it really, that was the only, I had several different corks out and that was the one that, that was getting all the bites. So, you know, I'm not stupid. I noticed that. I was like, okay, well I'm going to start using all bombers, you know, and, right. and pretty soon I was using all these and I used these for a long time. And then the, the blabber mouth came on the scene and, um, and that's pretty much, what I'm using mostly now, but I feel like some days, you know, maybe when it's super calm, this court might be a little too much. So it's, it's not a bad idea to slide that, that little bit more subtle cork out there yeah. and see if you get a few more bites on it. Um, this, this cork shines on a, on a choppy day. It really shines on a choppy day. I've seen it where it will outfish everything else you have. Uh, with there's if there's any amount of chop on the water, you know, significant chop. I mean, you know, a foot a foot or so, a foot and a half. So that that's definitely what you should use it. But I would say have a variety. Have have uh have some of these. Have some um, some bombers maybe or whatever else you like. I, I know there's there's everybody's got their favorite brands and everybody's trying to come up with the the latest and greatest cork. You know, it's, but it's really all the same. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and so for the for the people like me who maybe aren't used to um, fishing, fishing with corks or whatever. Can, can you kind of go into detail and explain a little bit about what the purpose of that cork is? Like, what are you trying to get that thing to do? To I mean, is it just make so, a bunch of rac ruckus, racket? Right. Yeah, yeah. Just make as much noise as possible. Um, it's it's really that simple. Um, you know, a lot of people nobody really knows what the drum think it is. I think it sounds a heck of a lot like another drum feeding is what it sounds like. Yeah, it definitely oh, does. Okay. I mean, I, I've I've been around enough drum bullet on top busting bait on top and it sounds just like a drum rolling on the surface so it, they're, they're just naturally curious they're going to come check it out um what i tell people also is you know when you pop it you don't just want to do a little little wimpy pop you know like you would on a trout court you want to kind of sweep that thing through the water so it goes swoosh swoosh like that and I tell people that the pop is, I mean, the pause is just as important as the pop. So it's good to let it sit there for a second. Some days the fish seem to like it uh, if you wait a little longer. Other days they want it a little bit more aggressive. It just, you know, it's kind of like topwater fishing for any fish. Let the fish tell you what they want. Kind of kind of vary it up and whatever's working, kind of go with that. Okay, so kind of change up the rhythm a little bit and mess around and see what it hits. Yeah, I don't, but I don't. I don't sit there and like go what, pop, 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 pop or anything like that. I mean, I don't. I don't, I don't ever. I don't ever fish that aggressively. I'll just go. I'll pop it and wait. I, I tell my my clients just to pop it and wait three or four seconds, and then pop it again. That that way it gives the the lure time to settle on the leader, and that's when you're gonna get your bite anyway. Are you varying how hard you're popping that depending upon depth? Like if you're a little shallower fishing, are you not popping it quite as aggressively, or or vice versa? Or do you kind of just same way all the way across the board uh yeah that's a good question um sometimes we, yeah when we're getting a little shower like i found a big school of fish in two feet of water the other day and we cut we hooked one uh before they really realized we were there and uh i looked down and there was just red fish everywhere like giant reds all swimming all in the boat you know mud puffs coming up they were really startled and the other guy I had on the boat tried to he was trying to get a bite and they just wouldn't touch anything. They just wouldn't touch it. Yeah. I mean, they were, they were, they were spooked. They were freaked out. I, I think they didn't want that big heavy bait, you know, that big loud bait anyway, maybe something more subtle could have gotten one to eat at that point. Uh, so yeah, I think, I think if you're in shallower water, um, it could definitely help to be a little more subtle. However, I've caught a lot of fish with a pretty aggressive pot throwing in a bait in real shallow water. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, mean, bet it, that, I bet it really depends on like how far away that fish is from it when you pop it. If it could be a foot deep, and if the fish is ten feet away and you pop it hard, he's good. But if he's a foot away and you just smack the crap out of it, that probably is going to spook a fish. You know? Away. Yeah. 
So, yeah, I mean, if we if we can see these fish, I'm sure there's, you know, if the water were clear enough to see them, I'm sure that they they react differently. You know, there's yeah. some that probably just run away from it. They see it and run away from it. There's some that go straight to it and yeah. you know, it's like they eat it like it's their last meal. Yeah, those are the um, ones you want, anyways. <laughs> that's right. That's right. But I've, I've thrown into a school of bait before and um and, and hook three or four fish at, at one time i mean you, you know when there's they're, they're usually not by themselves there's usually more than one fish in a pot of bait like when you're really in them good sweet um and, go ahead and, and what so and this is questions coming up a lot in the in the chat here i mean man by the way if you guys are watching we appreciate you asking questions like this is the fun part of the show just the interaction uh so obviously a lot of a lot of motion going on here a lot of popping how are you rigging this up, man? How are you keeping everything okay. stable on there? So, let me get a prop. Hang on. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> um, I've got, what I use, I'm a Z-Man guy, so, I mean, I love Z-Man baits. They're just, there's so many advantages to them. Not, I mean, the biggest advantage is they catch fish. It's a um, good one. But, but they're super durable. Um a lot of times when we're fishing these uh, these baits, we're fishing around bluefish, small bluefish, and these things are bluefish, virtually bluefish proof. I mean, blues cannot bite through them. Uh, other brands, you will lose a lot of baits to bluefish. So, but what I what I this is a bait that I've been fishing with for right from the get go before they became uh, really in the last couple of years super popular. But this is a the six inch uh, Z Man Swimmer, which is a just a solid bait. Um, that's what that's all I fish with. That's all I use. And um, always chartreuse. No, that's just that's just, that was just the color I picked up. I use some natural colors uh, sometimes. Um, let's see, you know, some some kind of bait fish looking patterns like that. Something more if the water's yeah. a little clear. Um, I'll use, uh, white's always a good one. White's, white's a go-to. Um, you know, just solid pearl. Uh, let's see. This one happens to be a pretty good one. This gold. I like that one a lot. Um, so, you know, I really only use about three or four different colors and I stick with them and that's it. Um, I don't think the fish are too picky. Um, if, if one of them seems to be it's really rare that you see that one color is really getting singled out by the fish. Um, most of the time, we're throwing different colors and they're all fishing about the same. But I have seen I have seen it where one color is getting all the bites, and I'm pretty fast. I'm pretty quick to switch over to every. I'll put the same color on every every pole if I have to. Whatever's catching. Nice. But but so let me get let me get into a little more detail. Um, so that that bait. It's important not to have too heavy of a jig head because if, if your jig head's too heavy it will pull your cork under and you'll lose buoyancy so what we use is a quarter ounce jig head this is the z-man headlocks jig head and it has a six alt hook so it doesn't really matter i mean i'd love for you to buy these and use these jig heads because they're awesome but um you can use anything you want as long as it meets certain parameters it's not too heavy and the wire is stiff enough to where you can it won't bend out. You can put some fairly uh, fair amount of pressure, fair amount of drag on these fish, um, and it won't it won't straighten. Now a lot of a lot of jig heads, if you don't have a thick enough wire, it'll straighten the hook right out. So, and that would be a bad scenario. I'd lose a fish because of that. This is this, the again. This is a Z-Man headlock jig head, quarter ounce weight with a six alt hook. And the hook's just got a bigger bite. Uh, even the six alt, when you're when I'm pulling out of their their giant mouths, it, it, it looks really small in there. So you could even use a bigger hook, but it's hard to find a jig head that's got a much bigger hook with that small amount of weight on the head. Awesome. How about uh, you know, kind of break down as far as how you're attaching your cork to are you going straight to braid? Are you putting some some uh, leader above it? And then Well I yeah, I, I, I have I've done both. So I'm I'm kinda I kinda toy with it sometimes. Um I get I get to where I like to attach the braid directly to the top of the court a lot because you don't have that leader there and that leader not getting in the way. But I have fished with a, maybe like a fifty or sixty pound shot of leader above the court. And that makes it nice if you want to switch uh you know, switch your 
cork over to a top order bait or something you already have a leader tied on and you don't have to rig you, you know you just got it ready to go uh but this year I, I've, I've lost the leader and i've gone to just a straight braid connection the only disadvantage to that is sometimes this braid will have a tendency to want to get twisted around the top of the cork or you know around your swivel or something like that you have to keep an eye on that it doesn't happen very often but it can and if the thing's twisted and fish hits it you're done i mean you'll break them off yeah uh, so about a two foot below that is about a two foot shot of, uh, fit 50 or 60 pound. I like the 60 pound. I use Berkeley big game monofilament. I don't, you don't have to use fluorocarbon. I really like that big game. It's strong. Uh, it's, uh, it ties a really nice knot that cinches down nicely. A lot of that heavier fluorocarbon is a little brittle, in my opinion. And I don't think it makes any difference whatsoever in the amount of bites you're going to get, fluorocarbon versus mono. I use a, uh, so that's about a two-foot shot, and you can't really see it on the camera, but I use I use a loop knot. And this is I use this loop knot, like, all the time for light tackle fish. I'm trying oh, to get it. There you go. There that's a hard game yeah, to play right there. There. there we go. Okay. So that, that loop knot right there, if you can see it, is called the canoe man's loop knot you can you can youtube it it's got a fun, funny name uh but there's a guy on youtube who ties it with a rope and you know a thick rope and you can so you can visualize it it's kind of like a perfection loop however it's a little different the t you know you tie it correctly when the tag end is kind of going down at a 45 degree angle um Canoe Man's Loop Knot, it's a, it's a super, super easy, strong knot and easy knot to tie. I can tie it in like five seconds, and it's great. So, and that, that kind of leaves, you know, lets the, lets the bait have a little bit better action on the leader. So, that's exactly how I rig it. Um, I don't really vary that rig much at all. I mean, I go with what works. I know it works. And uh, I like, to, some, some guys will go a little lighter on the leader, like 40 pound or 50 pound. I like 60. I think it gives me something to hold on to. I can actually grab it and, uh, you know, control the fish a little bit better. You don't want to just grab it, and if the fish surges down, you, you, can, you have to let go. You can't just hold on. It, it, you will pop it, but that 60-pound gives me a little bit more flexibility. Awesome. awesome. Man, a lot awesome. of great info. Right yeah, that's there. some great info. Um, if you're not – so I wanted to talk about topwater, too kind of jumping into when you're fishing top water are you looking for certain things fish already on the surface maybe fish blowing up do you ever just search like you're doing with a with a cork with top water yeah yeah and with, with with people on the boat i can i can use them as tools so i've got you know like let's say i have three guys on the boat i'll have two of them throwing a, a cork which sometimes you know which i'd say most of the time out fish is a top water but man some days i'll see it where they just want the top water it's really strange I have like two guys fishing a court and one guy fishing a top water bait. And if they're if they're rolling on the top water bait more, then I'm switching the, the court guys over to top water. So it just like again, it's kind of like let the fish tell you what they want. Uh, but if they yeah, if they're if they're actively up on top busting bait, you absolutely throw a top water. Yeah, yes. Yeah. But I've got many many b bites in the blind uh, throwing a top water bait. Now when you're fishing the scenario i described earlier when you're fishing a ledge kind of what i would call blind fishing it there's bait there but it's not up on the surface you're marking it down deeper uh i, I don't think find the top orders are super effective in that scenario but in shallow water it, you know absolutely but i have caught a lot of uh drum and you know deeper water on top water you know 12 15 yeah. feet deep They'll come up and hit it. They're already up in the water column anyway. They don't have any problem chasing that bait if they want to. Yeah. I actually, I actually caught one on top water one time dragging the bait behind the boat. I was <laughs> up on the front casting, dragging. I, I don't know why it was out there. It was just behind the boat. We were just dragging it behind. And I, I heard a pop. I heard a bust and w w uh, looked back there, and there was a drum that j had rolled on it. I ran back there and popped it one time, and it just piled on it. That was pretty cool. That's <laughs> super cool. Are you typically fishing like a walk the dog style bait or are you fishing, you know, popping top waters or whopper ploppers or anything like that? Um, yeah, I've, I tell you, I'll tell you what I fish and it, these, this bait's hard to get. Um, now they don't really make them anymore. I don't think, but oh, dang. I, I, fish, I fish that Sabil splasher. Yeah. Those right things there. are awesome. Yes. Yeah, I like that bait a lot. Um, it, that's a, that's a real heavy duty bait that, uh, you know, it has a lot, 
the most important thing is just something that's got a big cup face that's going to make a lot of commotion that's got a wire reinforced uh, reinforcement on the inside of the bay. Because if you don't have that wire reinforcement, it's gonna it's just gonna come apart on you. Yeah. I mean, you, I mean, and I and we're catching multiple fish day in and day out, so you got to have something that's gonna they're gonna hold up. Um, I've I've had a lot of cheaper top water baits just fall apart. I mean, you know, you'll lose a fish or the hook will come out or something like that. So I, I go with a good. I mean, these are like twenty five dollars a piece. Yeah, they're uh, those Seville stuff's pricey. But I've used that bait for a long time. This is a great bait. It's got that huge cup on it. Um, but I, I have used, to answer your question, I have used some, some Walk the Dog style baits uh, and gotten bites on them. Um, but day in and day out, I really, I really prefer the popper. Yeah. I, I think popper just seems to work the best on them. They see, it gets bit more than any other style of bait. For sure. Um, I've, I've experimented with some really large walk the dog busky baits, like some nine and 10 inch baits that you, you know, there's all kinds of cool drum baits. If you, if you search for musky lures online, you, you, you'll see all kinds of stuff that you want to try for drum, like big spinner baits. And, and I'm sure they work, you know, to various degrees. Um, like the Whopper Plopper. You mentioned the Whopper Plopper. That's a, a very good one. Um, I've got one right here. I've got the biggest one they make right here. I think it's nine inches long. Um, <laughs> I, I fished that bait some. Uh, believe it or not, I mean, I've caught fish on it. They'll hit it. But believe it or not, they don't seem to like it as much as some others. I mean, yeah. um, you know, you think it would just work, work like magic. But uh, I've actually thrown it in some pretty active fish and been surprised at how... Uh, how slow it was to get bit really but yeah it's nice because um, clients can work that thing so easily it just cast it out and straight retrieve it not to do much it is. But. yeah it is it's uh it's it's nice it's a, it's a fun bait it, it's just it's just for kind of for novelty sake than anything yeah. else they get a good laugh out of it but uh sure. but they do work yes and i, I believe use them nice uh, if you're not fishing corks and topwaters, is there another artificial you're going to that that you feel like produces pretty well, or are you mostly just sticking to those two things? Well, I mean, some of the other guys they'll throw, um, you know, any like rattle traps and um, crank baits and uh, and swim baits and things like that in in these bait schools. And you know, I, I've taught a little bit about fishing the ledge, kind of in the blind, you know, where the bait's not up on top. But but the other scenario I want to describe to y'all is when you're up on a flat or whatever, and and you're, or, or wherever you could be out uh, beyond the flat, offshore of the flat in the deep. What I'm what I'm talking about is just like scattered bait schools everywhere, and real active nervous bait. And, you know, that's up on top with their noses out of the water, swirling. You're seeing slicks coming off the bait, bait schools, and I mean that's what I'm looking for every day. That's like that's like you've hit the jackpot when you find that. You'll, you'll see an area that might be like a quarter mile long where just be school after school after school after school, and you can line up your drift. You can kind of get up wind of them and line your drift up and go right through them and hit every one of them. And, but, you, but you'll, you know, there might be 30 schools of bait sitting there, and there'll be one or two of them that you can see that are behaving differently than the rest, and you know those are the ones that are holding the fish. Yeah. Like I, I might be fishing, like they're all nervous, but there's one school. Where the, where the school goes like that, you know, it flares up, you know, it's, it's just, it's just real agitated. And I, in that case, I'll just go right, I'll beeline it right to them. I'll just, I'll put my trolling motor on high and go right to them and get a cast in them quick. And usually when that happens, we catch a fish, we get a bite yeah. or two or three. That's cool. The times I've fished up there and I don't know much about that area and fishing it at all. I've, I've had some luck up there, but that's what we've always done is looking for the, like kind of drifting through those scattered um pods of bait and and, and pop and corking in those in those scattered groups of bait fish and I, I when i first went up there someone told me like all right and this was before I, I was fishing in louisiana and understood how these bigger fish move they were like you got to be in 15 to 18 feet of water and so like the whole day i wasn't varying at all i was like we're not going any shallower than 15 we're not going any deeper than 18 and just staying in that and we we caught fish for sure but but i i, I was i was dead set on on that depth and uh, it, it's it's cool. I mean, those fish are they're they're no different than the fish anywhere up and down the coast. They'll they'll be in a foot of water. They'll be in you know sixty feet of water. They don't they don't they don't they care. Get, they, they go wherever they want to go. Yeah. I mean, they're, I mean, I, I've been quite shocked at some of the places I've found them at times. So. That's cool. But they'll get real shallow too, and and you can't see them. You cannot see them. They will not show themselves unless you push them or spook them or something like that. Like that school the other day. The only reason why I knew they were there is I saw one streak across the top chasing a mullet up towards the bank. 
I said, uh oh, there's one there's a drone over there. So I went over there and it was up on top of this flat in two feet of water. And when I got up there and started casting, I noticed that there was a the whole school kind of started waking a little bit. Yeah. Like, you know, away from there. Still within casting links and I, I made a cast and got and was able to cook that first one, but after that it was over. There we couldn't get enough bite out of them. Then they popped up about a hundred yards away and we, we got a, we caught a second one out of them. And then I got a third bite, but but they that was it. They, we spooked them twice and they were done. Yeah, yeah. And when you say casting distance for somebody who maybe just has a boat, they're going up there, they run up on them, they see them start boiling up. Like what? How how? Like what kind of distance are you staying away from that school of fish so you don't do any more spooking? Well, I tell, or I, do tell, damage I, tell I tell my clients I say the second you think you can reach them, cast because I don't want to get too close. Gotcha. And, and and they are these fish are very spooky and and and. It's getting bad out there. People are running all over these fish all the time. And you see guys, the worst is you see guys running from from bait school to bait school, like running and gunning and just like, like, like they're albacore or something. They see a bait school, they'll, they'll run their boat right up, up to them real close, make a couple of casts, not get a bite, then they'll go to another bait school and do the same thing. What you need to look for is you need to look for a line of bait, like a, like a, a drift line. So you need to identify an area of bait, get upwind of it, Go out and around it, stay away from it, go up window and then drift into it and make a long drift through it. And then when you get out of it, kind of ease out of it and then you can then you can um, circle right back around to the other side again. So I, I remember one day uh, in the news I was fishing around everybody, I was fishing around some other guides and we all kind of knew what we were doing and we were real courteous of each other. And there was a nice little quarter mile section of bait on a ledge and it was showing real well. And everybody was just, it was like everybody was doing a circle through them. Like, you know, you take a drift through them, you get out of them, you eat up, ease out of them, maybe get a couple hundred yards away, then you fire your motor up, run way out and around them, and then back up wind them again, then start your drift again. We were just all taking turns going through them, and everybody was catching fish because nobody was spooking them. Wow. Yeah, that's a yeah. that's a sweet, that's a good strategy, man. I think there's a lot of, you know, people who who don't know, you know, know that strategy or understand you know how to do that so that's that's good information because a lot of people are asking on our on our live stream chat here like hey does boat traffic and trolling motors and all that really spook these fish so that's good to good, good I, I don't think trolling motors i don't think trolling motors so much but outboards going over top of them absolutely i mean that will the worst thing that can happen is somebody runs a boat right 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 through your drill you know like just cuts you off because right they don't they don't know what you're doing they'll just go right 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 over your bow right through the bay, and you're just like, well, that's pretty much over with. Yeah. And, and what kind of rod setup are you using to get that, you know, I'll say maximum amount of distance? Like, what do you, what's, you know, you got your popping cork on there, you got your artificial on there, like, what do you recommend you as far as... could go, you could go with a longer rod, like a 7.6 or an 8, even an 8 foot or 8.6 or something like that, but what I use is a 7 foot medium heavy action cork grip spinning rod. And if you don't go with like a cork grip, you know, just a regular spinning rod... Um, and that's more for weight and, and self-preservation throughout the day because it is hard to do this for hours and hours and hours. And, and sometimes you'll be throwing these things for two or three hours with no bites, and you're, it'll wear you out. And so um, having a rod that's light but yet high performance enough and also uh, strong enough to handle these fish um, is important. I use a seven-foot I'm – a, I'm a TFO guy. I use a seven foot TFO inshore series, medium heavy. Uh, it's a great rod. TFO. I've been using TFO rods for a long time. They're 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 high performance rods, but yet they're not four or five hundred dollar rods that will break on you. I mean, everybody would like to have a five hundred dollar spinner rod. It's, they're super light, but they're just not as durable as I need them to be for for charter fishing. So I, I I feel like I got a I got a good rod with that rod that's durable but yet high performance and. I mean, I've caught these fish on a medium light, the same series of rod on a medium light, trout fishing. You, you know, you'll, have, you'll, you'll cook one every once in a while just by chance. But that medium heavy cork grip of any, of any good rod manufacturer is probably what you need to shoot for. Okay, excellent. And, and what kind of reel are you putting on there? How heavy is the reel? Like what kind of setup do you um, have there? I use a uh, – I've been using these um, – I'm a Daiwa guy now. I, but I used to use quantums, and I've, I've still got a lot of these uh, uh, quantum cabos. They're and I use the Cabo 40, and man, they're they're great reels. They are super super good reels. They got a great drag in them. 
Uh, they have they are bulletproof. They've been very very tough reels for me. They're 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 a lot tougher than your average four thousand series spinning reel. I've used some Shimano's that had the felt drags. The felt drags do not hold up on these fish day in and day out. I've been this is like the I think the sixth season I've been using these Cabo. Oh, that's awesome. Same, same reels. Yeah, so they're they're great reels. Um, I'm sure. What I would look for is a, is a reel that has um, you know carbon fiber drag drag washers. The felt drags just just do not. They will not. They'll burn up. You'll just burn them up. What uh what pound braid are you fishing on those reels for those fish? I fish forty pound braid. 40 I pound fish braid. a. Um, I use this this brand um, that my my one of my guys that helps me out with a lot of my my overflow uh, charters uh, Scott Wood. He turned me on to this this brand. This is called c Knight Monster 40 pound uh, WA. It's a it's an awesome braid. It's an eight strand braid. You can order it on Amazon. I don't I think it's a Japanese company honestly, okay. but I just love it. It's it's really smooth. It casts a lot further than most braids I've used. Uh, I used to use Finn's braid, but that's by far a superior product there. Nice, that's awesome. Yeah, I should I should have had a uh, Amazon affiliate link. So I could just pop on there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, hey, if anybody's watching right now, um, definitely leave your questions. We're kind of wrapping up here in the next five six minutes or so. Uh, so be sure to to leave your questions. If I don't even know how we could have any more questions, man. You've answered so many questions just by sharing your knowledge and your wisdom uh, of that fishery and, and fishing for years, man. It's such a great, uh, dude, it's almost been an hour. It's like how in the world have That's we been That's crazy. It feels like we're talking like 20 minutes. Yeah, it's been great. It's been great. Well, I'm so, glad, I'm, yeah, I'm glad to share it. And I'm, thank you all for listening. Do you want to give us a quick little rundown? I know you don't do much bait fish anymore, but I know there's some guys out there that do it. Kind of what you're looking for when you're bait fishing, kind of quick setup and, and whatnot. Yeah, I would say one one piece of advice for bait fishing is use as much as many rods as you can. Like as many rods as you, as you can put out, it, it helps. It really like does. Like a cat fisherman. Because, because you think think about all those baits as a collective chum slick, right? Yeah. Like I don't, I don't chum, but I fish a lot of poles, eight or ten poles if I can, and uh, when I bait fish, and so all those baits going in the water, that there's your chum slick right there. So you don't need to add more chum. I've, I've always been a huge fan of mullet. I, I've used primarily mullet. A lot of guys use menhaden, uh, and they and they work just fine in a lot of a lot of circumstances. Sometimes they work better. Uh, you know, fresh caught menhaden, you throw a cast net. Uh, you know, get get all you want in a lot of places. But uh, I've always actually gone through the trouble of, of buying or you know m fresh mullet, and just because I, I had confidence with it, and it seemed to work the best for me. Okay. Uh, you know, your Owen Lupton rig, that's just, you know, everybody knows how to, you know, if you don't know it, go online, you can find it. Uh, you can buy them in stores pre-made, uh, lo the local tackle shops. Uh, but I would say fish as many rods as possible. And, and what you want to do is either fish a good ledge, a really sharp break, or fish uh, some oyster oyster bottom if you, if you know where that is. So... That these drum will they cruise these oyster lumps uh deep and shallow lumps in the sound the rivers and um that's where you want i mean there's basically just two places to set up for bait fish a, a sharp ledge or a shoal a edge of a shoal end of a shoal or an oyster bottom and that's that's it's really that's that's where you want to be that's where you want to be anchoring gotcha gotcha yeah. and, and are you using uh google maps or anything before you go out to kind of spot these things i know judson and i are going to do a, an episode next week where we're talking about reading google maps and doing that so i'm always curious to ask captains if they use that or if you just you've known the area for so long you just kind of know what you're doing there um well the, you can see some of those ledges on google earth um you know this you can see the sand coming off the bank and drop where the drop-offs are so you can see the shape of some of those shoals in some air, in some cases if the if the imagery is clear enough but um, really, just a good chart. That 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 one foot contour map that I have really helps, and you can get that on that the Navionics uh, site. You can upgrade your chip to a one foot contour, and I I've, I run a little ranch unit, and there's a way to actually make your own contour map with that. I haven't done it, but some of the guys who lake fish with those units do it, and that could be a very useful thing if you if you're really tech savvy and can figure that out. But I might be a little old old for that. I mean, I'm I'm <laughs> amazed at that being that tech savvy. So <laughs> it's crazy some of the stuff guys are doing in the bass world now with electronics. Oh right? yeah, I, I can imagine some of that stuff, like some of the Garmin Live View and some of the other uh, 
more live feed um, graphing could be pretty pretty beneficial in the side scan and stuff for the for the redfish up there. It, it can, but but you got to remember that that our our ledges and, and slopes and breaks in the sound and the rivers are, are usually fairly gentle. So there's nothing there. I mean, there is some stuff that's kind of relative to other stuff more dramatic, but not it's not like a lake where you've got you know underwater cliffs and you know just a lot of hard structure that's uh that's buried i mean that's underwater and all that it's just kind of it's 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 pretty so really just a basic chart if you know how to read a chart can really be super helpful yeah just yeah. study it it's just study it and really familiarize yourself with it and, and pay attention to your sonar when you're out there riding over these areas because you'll see you know you'll, you'll be able to ground truth all that stuff for sure well, we just had a question come in asking about and and this you talked about this with the owen lofton rig but just this one last question um are, are, is there a law as far as leader length when bait fishing and then with that let's kind of go into maybe how people should handle these fish when they're landing them and and releasing them what's because they're big heavy fish so kind of the the leader and then how to handle the fish uh the only well th there is a there are specifications on the uh the, the type of rig you know with your upton with your lupton rig and I think I think the specifications are the length from from the hook eye to the weight has to be less than six inches. So that's really important. Um, you need to go go on the deal. I, 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 honestly, it's been a while since I, I I make my Lupton rigs a certain way, and they're legal. But as far as checking into the uh, all the little details on the legality of the rig, uh, I can't remember those. But th but it's on the DMF website. They have a nice little uh, pamphlet or PDF you can look at. That shows you everything to make sure you're legal. Uh, if you buy store bought rigs, they're going to be legal. Um, but yeah, the the most important thing is the length from the weight to to the hook eye, and it has to be less than six inches. And that's important if you think about it. Like the drum, you know, the weight sitting there on the bottom, and the drum comes up and picks up the bait. You know, you don't want too much slack there because uh, if, if there's a lot of slack, you know, a lot of leader length between the weight and the hook, then the drum has a chance to swallow, you know, get it down in his throat. So if it's short, he's not, it's not going to have a chance to get down much past his lips. And that's, that's the whole idea behind the love to rig. It just prevents that from happening. Gotcha. And the other question, sorry. Oh yeah. The other question was just, you know, handling a big heavy redfish like that. Is there anything you're trying to do? So just the most important thing is just don't, don't grab him by the mouth or gills and, and put all his weight on his head. So just reach down and support his belly. I, I don't use a landing net. I just reach down. I just grab the leader and I reach down and I'm like I grab the leader with one hand. Then I reach down with my other hand and grab him on the tail. And then the hand goes off the leader and I go right under his belly. Gotcha. And I, and I, I've got real. I've got a pathfinder. It has low, low sides, so I can I can just lean right over there and grab him right out of the water and I, and I pull him right up on the gunnel and kind of slide him up on the bow deck and that that's when we get the hook out. Most important thing is just supporting his weight, keeping the fish horizontal, supporting his weight under his belly. Yeah. You know, don't mishandling a drum. You can de you can definitely mishandle a drum by grabbing him by the gill plates or grabbing him by the mouth. Don't use lip grippers. Don't grab him under the gill plates. Um, you also, if if you grab one out, if you pull one out of the water to take a picture, it's crucial not to leave him out of the water more than about a minute. I mean, seriously, thirty seconds, forty five seconds, but once you leave them out of the water past that point, the revival process is tougher. Like I, 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 sometimes I'll make that process 20 or 30 seconds at the most. Like I'll tell people, have your camera ready. When I pull the fish out, I stick it right in my client's lap. Click, click, click. Grab the fish. I and I just I'll just hurl them in the water head first, and not even sit there and revive them. Usually he'll just shoot right in the water and he'll swim right off. Nice. So he's literally out of the water 20 seconds. He torpedoes right back in the water. He's gone. He swims off. He kicks off like like nothing ever happened. For sure. But if you do leave him, if you do leave him out of the water a little bit longer than that, you might want not not want to just just propel him in the water like a torpedo. Actually, place him down in the water, grab his grab the tail, and kind of and when he kicks off, just let him go. Don't don't sit there and do that for too long either, because you're sitting there inhibiting his ability to swim off. If he kicks away, just let go, and he's okay. Nice. Yeah, yeah. That, that's that's good to cover that. I love that you know we and we always ask people that same question because I think different guides have different strategies. Um, so to kind of go back to the beginning of the show when we talked about the age of these fish, like 70, 75 years old, some of them can be. It's like 
Think about how you would treat your grandmother or your grandfather if you're trying to help them take a bath. You're not just going to chuck them in the tub. You know, you're going to take take care of them. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, the fish, the fish has been swimming out there for 70 years. I mean, you don't you know you don't want to be an idiot and be the one that kills him after yeah. he survived multiple shark attacks and who knows what else. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> That's very true. We had one more question that popped up. Um, barb restrictions. Are there barb restrictions on 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 your rigs for? for fishing these big redfish the only thing i know i know for sure is that the uh the bait fishing rig the lupton rig has to be a single barless hook so you, they, they should be barless uh, as far as the artificial baits go um there's no requirement on artificial baits to be barless nice awesome uh, but, but a lot of guys a lot of guys will push their bars down vol- voluntarily but honestly i i don't i don't usually push mine down because um it, it's it, I never hook them deep. Never. I mean, I never hook them much past a couple of inches inside the lips. And I, I always keep one of those uh, de-hooking tools that has little prongs on the end. You know, the little handle. I, I wish I had one to show you, but oh, you, yeah, you know, yeah. you, know you, you can just stick it in there. If, if it's if it's inside his lips, just a little ways, you can get it out very very easily. I don't think I've ever had one hooked in the throat with an artificial bait. Nice. Those uh, those crushers back there on those things are pretty crazy. Uh, on those big redfish, man, they're that's just yeah, a random thought just, I just had. You definitely don't want to stick your fingers back there too far. I've done it before and kind of gotten on the edges of them. Uh-huh. Man, I, I, it hurts. It hurts bad. Yeah. <laughs> so, I bet. So for any of you people out watching this that do catfish noodling, like don't try that on a red drum or a redfish. <laughs> right. So uh, you'll, 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 you'll be hating, you'll be hating your, your life after that. <laughs> we had. I'm just scrolling back through some questions here. We'll answer this. One more, um, Riley Ray said, what's the biggest drum you've caught on fly in the Pamlico? What did it eat? Uh, I don't know. Um, I mean, I, I honestly can't remember. Um, I mean, probably somewhere between 45 and 50 inches. I mean, they're all, most of the fish we catch are, you know, every day are usually 40 to 50 inch fish. I mean, right. like I said, it's a little bit more rare to break the 50 inch mark. It's it's pretty rare to catch them below 40 inches. And the, the vast majority of them really are in the mid forties to upper forties. So I, I guess that fish would have been probably somewhere in that range. Cool. And, and he ate, you know, just any, any fly, if you're going to fly fish, any, any big fly that's got um, a substantial hook, you know, you just want to, you don't want to bend the hook out. You got to use a big enough hook um to you know make sure it doesn't bend right right and what size i'm curious about fly fishing what size uh weight rod are you using on that like a 10 weight 12 weight 10, 10, 10 weight's a good a good size 10 10 or 11 is substantial you could probably land one on a nine but you would be fairly overpowered most people most guys are using 10 yeah uh, 11 would certainly work fine or even a 12 but 10 10 is what most guys use okay Awesome, man. Yeah, yeah. we were talking a little bit about fly fishing before the show. Um, and you just got back from the South Olson River and the Watauga River. And what, what other river did you fish while you are up there? We fished the, yeah, we fished the New River for uh, for smallmouth one day. So okay. um, we had a good time. I, I fished with this uh, awesome guy up there out of Boone. His name is Justin Conway with Elk Creek Outfitters. He's a, he's I like a cool his name guy. a lot. Yeah, yeah, he's got a really, he's got the best name in the world. But yeah. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, he's a really good guy. He's become a good friend of mine, and um, and he if you ever if you ever want to get up in the mountains, you need to you know fish with him or fish with somebody like him. Uh, and and they have a really diverse fishery: trout, smallmouth, muskie. Uh, I actually caught my first muskie up there on that trip. Um, been trying to catch a muskie for a couple of years now, and we caught him by by accident, uh, smallmouth fishing. And, so, and that was on the cool. New River, right? That was on the New River, oh, yeah. New, oh, yeah, I gotcha. Yeah, and how big was that? You told us again, but it was it was forty inches, and that nice. that fish is hard. That's a hard fish to catch, man. Those fish are tough. They're, that is. They are. Hard. Yeah, Justin, Justin calls them. He calls them not the fish of ten thousand casts, but the fish of ten thousand dollars. <laughs> 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 because like that. that's what some people, have to, some people have to spend that much money to catch catch one for the first time. Yeah, that, that that's a a lot of trips with a lot of casting and that's uh oh yeah oh yeah that's a cool fish man that's a super cool fish well man thanks so much for for jumping on the show um you got anything else you want to ask billy and, and i'll let you close it out no man i once again appreciate it uh we always tell everybody thank you for trusting us with your reputation and if yeah. anybody's watching it watching the you know the live stream or the uh, replay here or you're listening to our podcast um be sure to go check out 
um, his website, which is uh, tarpamguide.com. Is that right? Tarpam. That's it. Tar- yeah, tarpamguide.com. Um, and man, I imagine you're probably pretty booked up right now. You got any open slots? If anybody watching or listening wants to go fishing with you, I've got. I don't have anything up until October, but uh, but I have other guides that help me out. They do a great job. And if you want to get on these redfish, I can get you out on, on with one of them, and they uh, they 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 do a really good job. You'll have a good time. So okay, excellent. Give, so, us a call. give us a call. Yeah, so they'll just go on your website, and give you a call. They can also read about that uh, that that freshwater or sweetwater as it's been called on the show, that fishing trip that you took. Uh, once again, you got a yeah. blog, an article, all that stuff that you're keeping up with, fishing reports yeah, we, on the website. We try to so. keep it fairly current, but, uh, you know, we get busy, and sometimes that slips away from us a little bit. But yeah, man, try to get good content to read. Well, man, we appreciate you once again for being on the show. Hopefully we can have you back on. A lot of people are asking some trout questions, and we got trout season coming up, and everybody's fired up about it, so we're going to do a trout series and – who knows, man? We might get a few people on at the same time sharing some information. Yeah, that'd be so awesome. That'd be a fun show. Yeah, that'd we'll definitely fun. have to have you back for Trout and Striper and everything. Absolutely. Well, guys, it's been a privilege and a pleasure to be on here, and thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. Yeah, man, for sure. Appreciate it. Well, guys, if you're watching, we're going to go ahead and give away a couple of things um, as we are hanging out here. Justin, do you have the thing that your mom was going to give? The, I do. The so we're just going to hang out. Oh, we got everything scattered across the room here. Um, so we already gave away our catch of the week and now we are going to give away. Me, Sorry about let, that let there. Me, let me get him settled in here. There we, we got go. a pretty sweet tarpon painting. Look She's been loving thing. the tarpon lately. So we're going to give away this tarpon, um, to the lucky winner, commenting winner. To the lucky winner. And I'm going to do a random pick here. And... Here it is. Forest Gray. Forest Gray, man. Appreciate that. Once again, I believe you were... We were our first podcast subscriber, so send us your information here on Facebook or awesome. Instagram. Email etcurrent at gmail.com. Man, what a great episode. Great episode. Episode 9. So next week, Judson and I are going to be coming on. We won't have a guest on, but that doesn't mean you, you can't watch. you got to show up. We're going to be actually diving into um, some Google Maps. Hopefully, we might get to go fishing before then. So yeah. we'll be talking about that fishing trip as well. Uh, but really really diving into these maps and seeing like, Hey, how does, uh, you know, this Google imagery work for you is for finding fish and identifying different spots and some tactics that just Judson uses. Um, so really looking forward to that. Um, so really appreciate you guys commenting, being a part of the episode and we're going to be back here next week, Tuesday, 8 PM, uh, here on Eastern current. Do us a huge favor. Go like our podcast, share our podcast, share this, um, share this video if you've enjoyed it, and once again, go check out um, go check out Richard Andrews at tarpamguide.com for uh, doing the trip or, or whatever, or more information from him. So cool, man! For Let's sure, yeah, nine. yeah. Thanks for thanks for checking us out, you guys. We'll see you next week. Appreciate it. Go to etcurrent.com, get you a hat and a t-shirt, and we're gonna have a new t-shirt on there. It says, "I like it." <laughs> we'll get that one like worked it. on this week. Can't wait to see it. <laughs> right, see you guys. Have a great Peace. night. Peace.